Last week's celebration was indeed a different celebration. Do you all agree? Yes. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. You know, looking back, we thank God for what He has done for us, BC. So this morning, the question to ask today is, what's next? What's next after our 30th anniversary? What's next after we look back to the 30 years of God's goodness? How do we move forward from what we have observed and weakness of the past 30 years? You know, last week, focus was getting everyone to form the chain of spiritual generations. That's right. Do you see, turn to your neighbor and say, do you see your chain of generation coming up? Come on, turn to your neighbor and say that. Do you see your chain of spiritual generation coming up? Amen? You know, last week we heard amazing testimony from our VIP pastors and, uh, who share how they started their church and how God multiplied when His people are willing and available. So that is very important. Be willing and available. Everybody say, I'm available. Amen. Amen. You know, I believe all of you can have your chain of spiritual generation. This is not just for pastors, elders, or leaders. You know, I remember pastor shared with us about his mother. Remember, mother at the age of 70 plus used the gospel bridge to share the gospel with hundreds of people. Amazing. You know, even elderly lady can do that. So can you. You know, so tell the person beside you that your chain of spiritual generation is coming. Amen. Get ready. So we must now consider how to get ready. How are we going to get ready? Let's pray first before we begin. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, as we stand before you today, we come with open hearts, eager to dive into the richness of your word. Your commandments, O Lord, are not hidden from us. And we seek to understand and apply the wisdom found in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and 11. So Lord, today we ask of you to open our hearts, Lord, to fully understand the depth of your requirements and to respond with willing and obedient spirit so that we will all be generation, be a generation that is ready to possess the promises you have set before us in BC. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 to chapter 11. Let me just share with you. You see, the Israelites were about to enter their inheritance. They had spent 40 years in the desert and witnessed God's discipline, blessings and miracles. Now, Moses was instructing them on what they needed to prepare. To prepare what? And also to visualize as they enter to possess the land. And Moses was guiding them how to secure their future in this new land. So the three questions we want to consider and answer this morning will be, number one, what secure our future? What do we need to do to see a future of fruitfulness? Amen? Second, how do we value the next generation now so that we can build a successful chain of spiritual generations? And the third question we want to answer is, what decision, choices will stand the test of time so that we will walk in the blessings of God? Amen? So first thing, what secure our future? Let's read a portion of the scripture right now from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 to 13. You can look at the screen or turn to your Bible. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways and to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes which I command you today for your good. 
Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belongs to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and He chose their descendants after that, after them. You above all peoples as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no more, no longer. Amen. The first thing, how, what secure our future when we circumcise our heart? The scripture brings us to verse 15, at the end of verse 16 that says, Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. So God had just gave the Israelites a high standard. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 to 13, we have just read that. And then God calls for a wholehearted commitment to Him, complete allegiance. Such standard can only be made with, by, with a circumcised heart, which we read just now in verse 16. You see, God was calling them to carry out a spiritual transaction. A spiritual transaction, a spiritual surgery on their heart, on their heart, not a physical uh, of circumcision. Are you with me? You know, in the culture context of the Israelites, physical circumcision, which involved the removal of the foreskin, was a sign of covenant between God and the people, as shown in Genesis chapter 17, verse 10 to 14. But circumcision of the heart is different. It symbolizes a spiritual change. A spiritual change. It implies spiritual transformation. Removing stubbornness or resistance to God's guidance. So it signifies, what it signifies? It signifies an obedient relationship with God and with a heart committed to following His commandments. You know, while specifying the requirement, Moses interjected the attributes of God, highlighting that God's ownership and His affection for His people. Read again in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. It says that heaven and the highest heaven belongs to the Lord your God and also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord's delighted only in your fathers and he chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples as it is this day. Notice in verse 14, when we take a look at verse 14, look at verse 14. You know, Moses pointed out that God owns everything in heaven and on earth. Absolutely everything. Amen? And look at verse 15. What does verse 15 say? Delighted only, chose you above all peoples. These words show that God chose the Israelites. You know, interesting to note that God being the owner of the whole universe, He still chose the Israelites. He had the right to choose anyone, anyone on earth for His redeeming purposes. Yet, He chose them. You see, the point of putting verse 14 and 15 together in this way is to stress that God's freedom and His rights and authority. Amen? And so we know that through Jesus Christ, now the election of God has now include all of us. Praise the Lord. And who, all of us who believe in Him. What a privilege to know that God of the universe choose to set his affection on us. Praise the Lord. You know, and we must reciprocate by loving God wholeheartedly. By loving God wholeheartedly. Because of God's love, He wants our heart to respond in service and mercy. Our heart, our heart is the command center of our soul, mind, will and affections. Isn't it? is a vulnerable place because of sin. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 said this, that the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. The person whose heart has been deceived has willingly believed a lie and now acts upon what is untrue. So to be more particular, 
You see, circumcision of the heart implies humility, a humbling process, and cleanses our, cleanses our minds from pride. And, and this cuts off the, the thoughts of that I'm rich, I'm wise, and I need nothing. And convince us that we are wretched, poor, miserable. It convinces us that we are all sinners and we are not able to help ourselves. Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing but to add sin to sin. Therefore, church, it is impossible for us even to think of a good thought without the assistance of His Spirit. So Moses point, points out that the stubbornness of the heart as an obstacle to a genuine relationship with God. Stubbornness can manifest as rebellion, pride, or refusal to surrender to God's will. Are you listening? You see, we are called, church, we are called to examine our hearts and identify areas of stubbornness or resistance to God's guidance. And through prayer and repentance and a commitment to God's word, we can experience a circumcision of the heart, allowing this transformative power to work within us. I want to share with you a testimony of a lady who chose to allow God to circumcise her heart, but that took several months of her. I want to read her story to you. Some of you have heard about her story before. Pastor Judea Halim. You ever heard of him before? You know, I came, I want to read her story. I came from Indonesia to Singapore and gave birth to a baby that has three holes in the heart and a brain damage. Then three years later, I was served with a stack of divorce papers. I was forced out of the house with my daughter just like that. There was no help at all. And after I become a Christian and wanted to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, God told me to forgive those who have hurt me. In my heart, I was thinking, forgive God, the whole, God is telling me to forgive your ex-husband who have cheated on you, abandoned you, and forced you out of the house. In my heart, I was thinking, forgive him? What? I thought... To forgive will be like someone trying to swim back to shore after being thrown into the deep ocean. When I was not a worshipper of Jesus Christ, I didn't have to deal with this. To become a disciple of God, I must forgive. I came before God and said, God, it is difficult. It is so difficult. But I told the Lord, I'm willing to perform your spiritual circumcision in my heart, Lord. And I took his picture of my ex-husband and placed it next to my bed so that at night, before I went to sleep, I, could, I had to see it once. And when I wake up in the morning, I had to see it once. Every time I saw his face, the volcano of bitter emotion boiled within me. And I would come before the Lord and say, God, I cannot do it. It is too impossible for me. There is no way I can forgive this man. But I'm willing, Lord. I'm willing. Perform your spiritual circumcision in, on me right here in my heart and right here in my head. It is not that I pray once and one day, suddenly, the next day, the wind came from my side and straight away I become an angel and could forgive. No, that did not happen. Persistent counts. I did this every day, months past. I kept repeating this to myself because I refused to allow negativity, depression, and discouragement to take control and become rooted in my life. One day, out of the blue, I look at the picture, that picture again, my ex-husband, and the erupting volcano was somehow gone just like that. Praise the Lord. You know, a few years later, I had a chance to meet my ex-husband again. He had remarried by then. I shared with him about our daughter and everything about my life. And this is what I told him. You must receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior because Jesus saved me and Jesus saved your daughter. And your daughter is healed from a heart condition. 
Praise the Lord. Guess what? He received Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. All glory to God. What an amazing testimony, right church? You know, to, of how to let God circumcise our hearts. Church, you know, there is a condition. Is there a condition, an anger, a bad habit that you need to surrender? That you need to surrender before the Lord. If you want the rest of 2023 to be different, you need to begin to be honest and surrender and let God circumcise our hearts. Amen? The second thing, what secure our future when we fear the Lord? Everybody say, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20 says, You shall fear the Lord, your God. You shall serve Him and to Him you shall hold fast and take oaths in His name. You see, the fear of the Lord is a phrase mentioned 50 times in the Bible. How many times? 50 times in the Bible. People are here and they are confused. They, they don't like the term, the fear of the Lord. It's a good term, church. You see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, says Solomon. The fear, the, the word fear means respect or rever, uh, reverend. Reverend before God. This fear is not the fear of being punished by God. It's not like, man, if I don't do this, God's going to kill me. God is going to slap me upside down. That's not the idea of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord means worshipping and being in awe of Him, loving His holiness that leads to a humble submission to God. Unfortunately, Many believers today have lost the fear of the Lord. And that's one of the greatest tragedies we face today. It's what we call casual Christianity. We love God, but we do not fear Him. You see, casual Christianity can be described as superficial approach to our faith. Amidst our busy lives, we are all busy. It's easy to slip into a pattern where our Christianity becomes a labor, a Christian by name. Are you listening? Rather than a true commitment to God. And we show signs of casual Christianity when, number one, we pick and choose which aspect of God's word to follow. We pick and choose. This one, I don't really like to, you know, it's hard, it's difficult. I don't follow. So great, praise the Lord. This is a good word to follow. We pick and choose. Or, or number two, when we neglect the uncomfortable or ch uh, challenging teachings. Number three, when our belief and behavior align more with the world views than with biblical principles. Signs of casual Christianity. You know, having such attitude towards God that we convince ourselves that there is no real consequences of neglecting Bible reading, your prayer life, or the local church. Fear can be healthy. You know, sometimes it's the only thing that motivates people to obey. Amen? You see, I'm not talking about the fear of losing our salvation. But I'm talking about a healthy fear of God that will motivate us to be more than just casual Christians. One day, church, we will all stand before God and give an account of how we have used the gifts and talents that, the, that He has given to us. And that is not a casual thing to consider. Are you listening? That is not a casual thing to consider. We must take it seriously. You know, look at what Moses teaches the people in verse 14. That everything belongs to the Lord. He owes everything. The Lord lacks absolutely nothing. You see, think about this truth for a moment. What does God need? Nothing. He owns everything. God does not need anything or anyone. Right? What an amazing message that Moses share that God is the owner of heavens and earth and everything on earth he holds dominion over all things and we should church we should have complete reverence and fear towards God because he is in total control 
Amen? You see, take time to meditate on the majesty and greatness of God. When we consider that, this will allow us, you know, to stand in awe of who He is. It is a desire that is important. You know, allow this awe inspiring nature to rekindle a sense of reverence in your heart. It is a desire not to offend God because we love Him. So how do we fear? How do we fear the Lord? We fear Him by having a submissive attitude towards His will, expressing our love for the Lord. It acknowledged that our future is secure when we trust the one who holds everything. Amen? We can trust in Him. Amen? So what secure our future is not just a checklist of duties that you need to fulfill, but the heart surrender to the love and the will of our God. And as we fear Him, walk in obedience, serve Him and observe His commands, what happens here? We step we step into a future that is held securely in the hands of the one who created us, who chose us and loved us beyond measure. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. You know, one of the very powerful biblical story that illustrates the motivation to obey through the fear of God is the story of Abraham and Isaac from Genesis chapter 12, the 22 verse 1 to 19. Remember the story? The story of Abraham. You see, Abraham had been blessed with a son named Isaac. His only son in his old age, a son whom he loved dearly. However, one day, God wanted Abraham to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering to God on the mountain. Despite the emotional agony, Abraham, guided by his fear and reverence for God, responded with faith and chose to obey. You know, when Abraham was about to kill his son on the altar table, at that crucial moment, an angel of the Lord intervened, preventing the sacrifice. God has seen Abraham's faith and obedience. Amen. You see, the story of Abraham and Isaac demonstrate how to fear, how the fear of God understood as deep reverence and trust, you know, can motivate profound obedience. Abraham's willingness to obey even when faced with such difficult decision shows the fear of the Lord in him. You see, this story is a timeless example of the fear of the Lord, motivating obedience and the reward of trusting in God's wisdom and plan. So church, this morning, let us examine our hearts. Casual Christianity is a subtle danger that, could, that can pro- compromise our faith. That is first. Second, may we discover the fear of God, recognizing it as beginning of wisdom and the catalyst for a deep relationship with our God. Amen? Thirdly, what secure our future? When we remember the past, help us to visualize ahead. That's from the passage, Deuteronomy chapter 11, 2 to 7. Keeping alive the memory of the past is very important. You know, Moses spoke about a significant events concerning God's miracle in the Exodus. We will read from Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 2 to 7. I will not read, but you can return back. Okay? A very positive story. He also talked about the last known account of what happened to some people who rebelled against God. And God wants us to look at history and to see what He did. And we learn far more by looking at what God has done. Amen? You see, the generation behind us need to hear these stories as it gives them a framework to build the values and decision of their lives. In the Bible, remembering 
is remembering, reattaching something that has been amputated. Church, we need the memory as an anchor because we tend to drift. The video at our 30th anniversary stretches back to George Mueller, 1805 to 1898. And BC traced her route to Mueller branch of open brethren movement, the birthing of the brethren movement with seven believers in Singapore was started by the founder of the departmental store. What? Robinson, that's right. Philip Robinson, right? He started the mission rooms, then became the Bethesda Gospel Hall, then the Chinese Gospel Hall started, followed by many other Bethesda churches. 2016, we marked the 150th anniversary of establishing the first Brethren Assembly. Praise the Lord for that. Let's give you a round of applause. Praise the Lord. You know, church, when you watched the video last week, what's in your mind? What is in your mind? You know, one of the goals of putting the video together for us is that it will inspire us. Say, inspire us. It's the new possibility grounded in God's grace. Amen? It's starting my chain of spiritual generations. It begin with that. You see, start, starting a chain of spiritual generation requires a willingness to be the first link. The small beginning that breached the past to the future. Church, every spiritual legacy starts with someone daring to take the first step of faith. What do you see yourself becoming? In two years' time, four years' time, six years' time. You know, it's always easy to believe that God can use someone else. However, believing that God can use you is a whole different story. If you look through the pages of the Bible and down through the ages of history, you will see that God chose to work with people. And when God wants to say something or do something, He always does it in partnership with man or a woman. Amen? So what's the cure of our future? When we understand that God delights in our willingness, in our willingness to take the step of faith, small beginnings are not insignificant. They carry the seed of God's joy and purpose. Every spiritual legacy starts with a seed of faith, as demonstrated by our root. Do not underestimate the power within this tiny seed. So church, starting by praying for one at a time. Amen? Next, what secure our future? when we know how to visualize the opportunity ahead and be proactive. Everybody say proactive. That's right. You see, as you look ahead, now I want you to visualize ahead. What opportunity or problems do you see? Do you see problems or do you see opportunities, church? There was a man, a salesman, who a shoe company sent, uh, sent him to Africa. So when he went to Africa, he got there. And when he got off the plane, he saw the people. And he immediately called back his headquarter, HQ, and said, I'm in Africa now, but I don't think we have any business here. A shoe company. You know, everyone walk around barefooted. They don't wear shoes. They don't need shoes. Send me back immediately. No business here. Confirm close shop. Well, one hour later, another salesman from another shoe company was arriving in Africa. He got off the plane, saw the people. He said, praise the Lord. He called back the headquarters saying, this is amazing. There's so many people who, here who need shoes. They are barefooted. Send all the shoes now here. Two men who sees the same thing but have a very different perspective. One sees problems and the other sees opportunities. So, it is for us. 
You know, when we see a lot of people, we can think of problems and issues and trouble. But for Jesus, he saw needs. Are you with me? He saw needs. When Jesus saw the people, he did not think of problems and issues and irritating people. He had compassion for them because he saw that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without shepherd. Amen? So, we need to start visualizing the opportunity ahead to see that we will have opportunity and not what? Problems. Alright, and when we Visualize opportunity ahead, we will have spiritual strength. Amen? Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 8 says, Therefore you shall keep every commandment which I have commanded you today, that you, will be you, may be, you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess. You see, notice the relationship between obeying and being strong. Let me say that again. The relationship between obeying and being strong. A disciple's spiritual strength is related to his degree of obedience. Are you listening? You know, if we frequently disobey, we, we snap our spiritual strength. Do you want to be stronger? Yes? Then obey. Obey the little things. You know, it's like you go to the gym weightlifting. You, it's like you grab a promise of God, you hold on to it and you put it into practice and your faith muscle gets built. And you do it again and you do it again and soon you will be strong. Amen? You can fight battles you have never fought before and you can go through things you have never gone through before because all this time you have been building the muscle, the faith muscle. Obedience brings strength. As the new generation enter the promised land, they are going to face many battles that require strength to take over. We cannot have a different future without a fight. Let me tell you. Right? As we intentionally observe God's command, we unlock the gates of spiritual strength. We will be able. Amen? Next, we can visualize that when we enter into the harvest field. Have all right, having to live in a prosperous land. See the slide on the screen. The verse, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 9 to 11 says, In the land which the Lord sworn to give your fathers to, to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sow your seed and water it by food, as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys. Let me explain this. You see, unlike Egypt flat and well irrigated land, Canaan is described as having hills and valleys. But it's very prosperous. Let me say that again. It's very prosperous. The contrast between the land of the Egypt and the promised land make a shift in the paradigm of God's people. Labor in Egypt was marked by toy and human effort, planting and irrigating on food. A lot of hard work. But the promised land calls for a shift from laborers' toy to dependent on God's provision. Are you listening? You see, the land's prosperity is intimately tied to the covenant relationship between God and His people. In obedience, we flourish in the abundance promises of God. Amen? Yet it comes with a call of a different kind of labor. What kind of labor we are talking about? That the land is ready. Hallelujah. The land is ready and the harvest is ready. So we must be ready to seize opportunities. Amen? So what kind of labor is, is this? Be ready to share a good reason for your faith. Be ready to share a good reason for your faith. Pastor, share with us that we must have a reason and it must be a good reason. Amen? Practice your testimony and learn how to share Gospel Bridge. 
yesterday to those who have attended Fasa uh, training on Gospel Bridge Track. If you missed it, you must catch up with your net leader and cell leader. To, to be equipped, we need to have the tools to share. And if you have been using it, good. Continue to use it. Then you need to sharpen your sharing. Keep practicing until you are very confident. You know, we cannot be sharing the gospel and say, I, 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 I don't know what to share, right? We got to be very confident. Articulate well. Because we are confident in this truth. Amen. Lastly, we visualize God's attention upon our every work to, and motivate us to obey. Having God's attention. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 12 to 14 said this. And now a land which the Lord your God cares, the eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And it shall be if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then I will give you the rain of your land in the season, the, the, earth, the early rain and the later rain that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. What does this verse tell us? That the land is under the care of the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, His eyes are always upon it. God's caring gaze is continually upon the land, ensuring its well-being from the beginning to the end of the year. God's attention to the land mirrors His intimate relationship with His people. You see, church, prosperity is not detached from God's care. It is a result of His continuous watchfulness and provision. And the promise of prosperity is tied to a fundamental condition, which is obedient to God. Obedient to God's commandments. Obedient is the key that unlocks the abundant life God's desire for His people. As we walk in obedience, we position ourselves to receive God's promised blessings. Amen? So, we have answered the first question. What secure our future? When we circumcise our heart and align our thoughts with God's way. Second, when we fear the Lord and walk in obedience and observe His commands. And thirdly, when we remember the past it builds our confidence and visualize the opportunity ahead with God's guidance and be proactive. So, after answering the first question about how we prepare ourselves, the second question we want to address is, what must I do now to start my chain of spiritual generation? How do we show that we value the next generation now? Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18 to 21. Let me read. See the slide. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart, in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be a frontlet between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord sworn to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. Does this passage sound familiar? Yep, Moses already mentioned this in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Anything that the Bible repeated is worth our attention, amen, and the utmost importance. Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 18 to 19 tell us, You shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and next you shall teach them to your children. Turn to your neighbor and say, teach them to your children. You see, Moses highlighted the importance of laying God's word in our heart, passing on the teachings to the next generation, emphasizing the significance of a healthy chain of spiritual generation. Joel chapter 1, verse 
tree. Put it in a nugget. You know, tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. So how do we show the value of the next generation? Can I suggest to you the three T's? The first T, teaching. You see, we must be intentional in passing the pattern of faith to the next generation because the next generation is counting on our obedience. Fast forward several years ahead. In the book of Judges, the Israelites were now in the promised land and a new generation has risen. Let's see what their spiritual condition was now. In Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Another generation arose after them they, who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. What happened? It was because the parents had neglected their God-oriented responsibility. You see, the result was that the new generation forsook the Lord and brought judgment on itself. So it is clear from Scripture then that if we as parents neglect this duty, we serve not only the ignorant and the unbelief of our children, but also their destruction. Are you listening? We cannot take this role lightly. Whether is it your physical children or your spiritual children, you know, don't think that you can have time to take it slowly, like the Chinese words that say man man jiao, just man man jiao. Remember that our children are our responsibility, no one else. You know, we are our children's spiritual guides. So we cannot take it slowly. You know, they are bound to learn from somewhere or somehow someone. So let them learn from you first. For those who have spiritual children under you, they are your next generation. God has assigned them to you and you are responsible for teaching them so that they can teach the next generation. So establish a routine of family devotion where you read, discuss passage from the Bible together. Some suggestion, you know, in teaching. Create an environment where family members can ask questions and share insight, fostering spiritual growth within the household. You know, some of the routine myself, I set in my family, that in the morning before the children go to school, my wife and I will read a short family devotion. And it's, a, it's, it's written in real relevant to the Singapore context. It gives practical suggestions of responding or behaving in different situations. We use that. And at night before they sleep, they will read the Bible and do their simple observation. And after that, we will explain to them the lesson learned. We try to do it daily, every day without fail. But sometimes we failed. There were times when we come home late from activity because it was and because it was a routine, the children themselves were asked before they, they, we, before they go to sleep, they say, we haven't done devotion yet. You see, because you have set a routine, they remember. So set a routine for them. And on Sunday, we, we learn from Pastor Keen that you, have, you need to have family cell time. So we have a family cell every Sunday you know, and before they go to sleep. Simple game, one worship song that the children will lead. Then I will share one inspiration with the children from scripture. Then we will get them to pray together. Get them into the momentum of cell time. Even it gets a bit chaotic. Set a routine. Alright, amen. Next, how do we show the value to the next generation? The next T, talking. In conversation about God, if conversation about God are limited to Sunday, it might reflect that your relationship with God is limited to Sundays. Church, God must be the center of our home, amen? The center of our conversation. And this can occur at all times, in all locations. Sitting suggests rest time. And walking indicates activity. And when you lie down, suggests evening time. When you rise up, 
suggests the morning hour. He said, our home sh shall be saturated with the value and principle of God's word. For example, the day two, two of my boys was playing and they lost control, they call each other names, they come to me and say, call, call me names. And then I, I, I tell them, you remember two days ago we memorized this scripture from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome words come out for your mouth, but only what? What is helpful in building others up. So they all recite, they say, so do you just say something unwholesome? What must we do? We must speak only words that build each other up. So you see, we, we use, we get them to memorize God's word and recite it and use it. It's relevant, you know, to our everyday life. And they learn, showing the children that we don't just talk about God, but we know that His word is important in our life. All right. So get to, we also get our children to talk to God not just on Sunday, you know, in, in, in pray all the time. Pray with them at every possible location and situation. In the car, before they go to school, at night, before bed, when they have anxieties, pain, or difficult times. Pray and talk to God all the time. Finally, how do we show that we value the next generation? The last T, transcribe. Transcribe. The world has many ideas and influence coming at them constantly. Let me share with you. You know, we need to constantly remind them about God's standard and truth. So the Israelites took Moses' word literally. You know, when they make this small little leather box where they worn on their head and forehead. You know that? In Matthew chapter 23, verse 5, God's command were to be wrapped up in their daily activity, hands, and always in the forehead of their thinking. You know, in our context, this may translate into creating a visible and intentional markers that will draw attention to God's commands. You know, in our lives, homes, and community, how we can help our children to memorize and understand Bible verses. I have a suggestion to all of you. You can remember PEAR, P-E-A-R. So put scripture memory verses around the house to capture their attention, giving them the right message. You can use a whiteboard, memo board, fridge, the fridge door, plant Scott's word everywhere or on the wall. All right, put. E, explain the meaning of the verse with the main, what is the main concept? Keep it short, right? So that the children understand what is the main concept. A, apply the verse to a situation or scenario, like what we, I shared with you just now. The example, you know, R, repeat at least five to eight times out. Make it interesting. You know, sing it and act movement. You know, we learn from CK teachers that music and action are the best way to help the children to remember God's Word, isn't it? You know, we started Scripture Memory on the Navigator series, the TMS with the family, uh, uh, a few weeks ago. And we find YouTube on, on music that goes with the Scripture verse. One of it is 2 Corinthians 5.17. And the, the, the song goes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has gone, the new is here. Well, the children immediately can remember. Easy. You know, it's amazing how we use songs to help them to remember the Word of God. You can also play a game like erasing the words of the verse one by one and see if the children can still say it. You know, or turn the verse into a puzzle and see if children can put together before the rest finish it, saying it. We can all kind of ways to bring the word of God. So church, let's be intentional in teaching the next generation. Be intentional, seizing moments to share the truth Scripture. Put it a routine and reminders in your home that serve as a constant prompt to live according to God's word. Amen? 
And church, there, I want to share, you know, there's one ministry of my heart, you know, and uh, we, I came to know the Lord because of the Boys Brigade ministry in the early days of BBTC. If not be, of my officer who invested time and effort to share, I wouldn't be here. And many of people here are also because of the BB and GB ministry, they are here. Praise the Lord for that. You know, there's one ministry that we are serving and there are hundreds of children awaiting people to come to speak the right value into their life and to make an impact. I know I always feel that BB and GB, being a Christian organization, is able to enter into school. is truly a miracle. We are able to use the Bible stories to teach children biblical truth and value. So come, you know, next year, 2024, we just received a news two weeks ago that the teacher tell us that another 62 boys and girls signed up for BB and GB. It's an overwhelming response. We thank God for that. Our current strength is 122 boys and girls. So adding up, we have 180 boys and girls. We thank God for the good response, you know, and we thank God for the favor from school leaders. And I think that we... I desperately crying out, you know, to God to send laborers. You see, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So join us in this ministry to impact the next generation. You, know, you can approach me or Agnes after service, you know, if in your own capacity and time to invest into the life of all these primary school students. Please join us. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, the final question we want to address this morning will be what decision choices will stand the time, the test of time? Let's read the passage, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 to 28. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the, Lord, the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. Now it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Iba. The decision of obedience to shape the future. You see, our culture really readily accept warning sign, right? Danger, keep out. Danger, high voltage. And danger, high flammable. Our culture accept warning sign. And it should also welcome, it also welcome invitation sign. Yet we clinch on the idea that God's put up both signs. God put up both signs. God put up warning sign. Warning, curse ahead, turn back. He also put out invitation, invitation, blessing ahead, keep going. If you really accept signs warning you of danger, do you accept such warning from God? You know, if you love to live in a world filled with signs marking invitation to blessing, are you thankful that God gave clear signs to mark the way to blessings? Do we? You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26, it says, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Moses told Israel at the edge of the promised land, Warning, curses this way. Invitation, blessing this way. You will turn one way or the other. You see, God gives warning of curses and invitation to blessing. Consider both and choose Choose which one? Blessings, of course. You know, like a good pa parent, the Lord did not want His children to be confused to what will happen if they obey or if they disobey. Interestingly, many people have no problem with parents laying out consequences for obedience and disobedience, but are offended by the fact that God laid out such consequences. They don't like the idea God's laying out consequences for the same reason children don't like the idea of their parents laying out consequences. Many adults live like children who refuse to listen to any explanation of the consequences and then find themselves facing the consequences. Sad. God gave warning of curses and invitation to blessing. 
You see, God is straightforward. He does not hide the curses of disobedience in an attempt to attract more people. God cares about people. He does not hide consequences. He makes these consequences so clear, very clear to us. So are you consider, as you consider the consequences of sin, please recognize that God is not eager to punish sin. He didn't speak these words in order to give himself an opportunity to condemn. He said these words to keep people from being condemned. He gave these warnings because he is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. God wants us to choose to know what each choice entails. These blessings and curses are quite serious to God. The choice between the way of blessing and the, the way of curses was so important that Moses, you know, named the visible reminder of generation after generation to see. You can go to Israel to see them today, today. You know, Mount Gerizim, the blessing, Mount Iba, the curse. Each group could hear the other as they stood on the mountains. You know, when any Israelite saw Mount Gerizim, Garrison or Mount Eba, they would remember that they were blessing of obedience and curses for disobedience. Those two mountains continue to be a place of public testimony. So decisions that stand to the test of time are rooted in obedience to God's commandment. The commandments reflect a way of life. The good life which God has determined for His people when our choice aligns with His principle, we position ourselves for blessing and life. Obedience is the big rock to which endures, enduring decisions are built. Church, understanding the nature of curses in the light of disobedience. So choose blessing. Turn to your neighbor and say, choose blessing. You know, as we navigate the journey of faith, let love and devotion to God drive our choices. Amen? Right, the decision to start a chain of spiritual generation next. Secondly, the decision to start a chain of spiritual generation begins with you. You know, believing that this is the responsibility given by Jesus to every believer. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, therefore he said, before he resurrected to heaven, when every believer becomes a disciple maker, there will be exponential growth of spiritual generation. Think about it. You see, when we invest our time in one person, one at a time, our impact will extend beyond our lifetime. Of course, it requires commitment and perseverance. The Holy Spirit will guide and strengthen us when we make ourselves available. Amen? So church, let us remember that each of us have the power to start a chain of spiritual generation. And it began with a personal decision to follow Christ and to extend our commitment to invest in others. It's a ripple effect of our faith and it can have a lasting impact on the spiritual landscape, reaching far beyond our lives and leaving a legacy of faith that will, continuous, that will continue from generation to generation. So in conclusion, you know, you'll see in your newsletter, at point three, you have three decision bullet boxes. You know, today I would like to challenge you to decide what choices you will take as BC begins to write the next chapter of our story. For the next two to three decades, put the tick there. Finally, Let's look at verse, last verse of today, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 32. He said, You shall be careful to observe all state, statutes and judgment which I set before you today. You see, I want to highlight the keyword all. I want to, ex to explore its significance in possess possessing and obedience. It called it all in obedience. All in. You know, as we are at the multitude of the promised land, God's provision is all-encompassing. The completeness of God's gift requires our all-in, our 
respond in obedience and commitment. 100%. You know, imagine the joy of experiencing God's abundance. Amen. Remember that partial obedience falls short and blessing flows from a complete commitment to God's commandment. In our faith journey, let the word all define our devotion. All, ensuring that we experience God's blessing and walk in the richness of His promises. So last decision is the decision to belong to the group, environment that chooses obedience to God. If you have been in BC over six months, you should be very familiar with the term covenant, right? In BC, we view covenant as a very important standard. Covenant in biblical is the idea throughout the Bible. You know, the Bible gives us example of covenant relationship between God and man and between man and man. And membership is biblical. Membership in the local church is, assu is assumed in the New Testament. Throughout the book of Acts, it becomes clear that local congregation of Christians know who were they, they, theirs. They, know, they knew to whom they were devoted to. Authority and submission are also biblical. The author of Hebrew exhort believers and say, Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your soul as those who, have, who will have to give an account. Amen. Lastly, membership, commit us to one another. We all value the covenant that God made with men because we know that God is abiding Himself to this covenant relationship. That's why we can be assured that God will do what He said He would. And we want that kind of assurance. Committing to one another in the covenant relationship is making a claim that no matter what, we are with these people. And commitment means we confess when we sin against someone, we forgive. We show mercy and grace. We give sacrificially as through caring for our own family because we are caring for our own family. When life caves in on you and begins to break away as you sin, you can rest assured that you do not face any of it alone because we are family. Amen? In a similar way, a church covenant serves to remind us of the relationship and commitment that we have entered with Christ and His church. You know, we do not gather just to have to do something or to feel better about ourselves. We are called together and we are committed to God and to one another to carry out the work that God has called us to Himself to do. Amen? So covenant relationship is a very important truth and power of the gospel that unite us to Christ and to one another. So what does BC membership covenant means? Take a look at the last week we we tried to do that, but it was running a bit of time. So I want to bring it back. You know what does BC membership covenant means? Number one, I will protect the unity of my church. Right? I will participate in the responsibility of my church. And lastly, I will play my part in building my church. Later in your small group, let's renew our BC membership covenant. You know, we are supposed to do it last week, but some of you may have done it. But for those who have not, renewing a church covenant relationship is a common thing that is done in many churches it is a meaningful and reflective process as we affirm our shared value commitment and mission you know i want to encourage you later in your small group to read through the covenant together as a small group discuss reflect and pray together and when you're ready renew this covenant together as a group sign on the paper as an act of commitment. Will you do that? Amen? I want to close. Can I invite all of you to stand? And I pray that God would unite our hearts together.
and that God will show us a dream. Amen? You know, without a dream, we exist and we just go from day to day. Some of you may have dreamed about a house or about this, but let's have one dream for God's work here. Let's pray that God would unite our hearts, give us a common goal, common dream, and God will raise all up as an army as we give our time, our talent, and our treasures. Let's pray for that. And I believe that God can do it. And I believe God will do it. Amen. Let's respond in prayer. Before I pray, let's take a moment to visualize. Every one of us, every eyes closed, every head bowed. I'd like you to visualize yourself having the chain of spiritual generation you want to raise. What do you see yourself in one year's time, two years' time, three years' time? How many generations, how many chain of generation you want to raise? Tell the Lord this day. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before you with gratitude for your guidance and blessing in our lives. As we reflect on the teaching of Deuteronomy 11, we seek your presence and wisdom as we prepare for what? The, the next. Lord, we give you the right to circumcise our heart. Show us, Lord, what we need to surrender this morning. We also seek for forgiveness for our casual mentality in pursuing our faith, Lord. This morning, as we stand at the threshold of the next level in our journey, we pray for strength and courage and resilience. Equip us, Lord, with the tools needed to face the challenge and to be aware of the opportunities that lies ahead. Lord, help us to grow in faith and character as we start our chain of spiritual generations. In obedience, impress upon our heart one at a time. People we can pray for, people we can share with, starting tomorrow, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your promises and the assurance that you are with us, Lord. Even in the times of uncertainty, we can trust in your unfailing love. May our preparation be grounded in faith and may we rely on you for guidance and strength. Holy Spirit, as we meet together, we also are thankful for the fellow travelers that you have put in our life teach us how to love one another as we grow and build up this church. We thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.